Hello and welcome to another Chai Chi Tuts video. Today's video we're looking at part 2.4 of Pai's time as a castaway. So we're looking at the island that he stumbles across and his arrival in Mexico, the end of his journey essentially. So as in the previous videos we're going to use the quotes to go off and we're going to use the quotes to get an understanding of the plot line of what happens when he's on the island, how he feels, um, what his um, emotions and thoughts are and then the same of Mexico. I feel like these two parts are a lot more plot based than perhaps you know when Pi is you know um, on the on the Pacific itself and he's trying to survive. There's a lot of analysis we can do about his character, about themes etc but the island in Mexico to me more represents the plot line that you could be asked in contextual questions. So you need to be aware of what goes on and what the order of events are. I made an exceptional botanical discovery, but there will be many who disbelieve the following episode. Still, I give it to you now because it's part of the story and it happened to me. So this is a very like interesting line to sort of start off with this venture with. Um, and it does point to the fact of, in my head, I'm, I always like a struggle to believe that this is a literal thing that actually happened, but perhaps it could be something figurative, something that Pi perhaps hallucinates. Um, obviously, he presents it as though this is something that actually happened. But um, I'll maybe speak a little bit at the end on sort of my opinion of it. But in terms of contextual questions, you would have to answer this as though it did really happen, even though it's difficult to believe. A dilated sleep that had brought no rest and no dreams. So that just speaks about his suffering and how we spoke about this in another video about how, you know, when you're in that situation, like a castaway, you're not going to sleep very well. I blinked deliberately, expecting my eyelids to act like lumberjacks, but the trees would not fall. So he sees the trees, he thinks it's some sort of joke or hallucination um, but he keeps blinking and they're still there who had ever heard of land with no soil with trees growing out of pure vegetation i felt satisfaction because such a geology confirmed I, that i was right that the island was a chimera a play of the mind by the same token i felt disappointed because an island any island however strange would have been very good to come upon to take in green after so much blue was like music to my eyes green is a lovely color it is the color of islam it is my favorite color the current gently pushed the lifeboat closer to the illusion. Chlorophyll heaven. I expected the bubble of illusion to burst at any second. It was my nose that was the judge of land. My legs began to shake. So he's noticing some sort of difference. And just the fact by virtue that it's different, just being on the open water is something of note and is something important to him. And gives him sort of this new lease on life. The algae had a sweet, had a light sweetness that outdid in delight even the sap of our maple trees here in Canada. But it was a tree, and a tree is a blessedly good thing to behold when you've been lost at sea for a long, long time. Oh, that I could be like it, rooted in the, to the ground, but with every hand raised up to God in praise, I wept. So he's sort of mimicking the trees and thinks of how he should, he wishes that he could be like the tree. A tree is like rooted on land because he misses land so much. And he's sort of, just like trees have their branches pointing up to the heavens, he wishes he could put his arms to the heavens to, to, to praise and thank God. Reluctantly, strictly for safety's sake, I crawled back into the lifeboat. So he's like not believing that this place is actually safe, that he can be there. It was very painful, but afterwards I fell into the deepest, most refreshing sleep I had had since the night before the Sitzman sank. When I woke up in the morning, I felt much stronger. I've read that there are two fears that cannot be trained out of us. The startle reaction upon hearing an unexpected noise and vertigo. I would like to add a third, to wit the rapid, the direct approach of a known killer. I fear the defensive wall of my whistleblowers was about to crumble and that he would attack me. I calmed down. I reminded myself forcefully that this had been my situation for the last long while, to be living with a live tiger hot beneath me. At every fall, I had a full meal of, full, full meal of algae. So as he's exploring, he just keeps on eating this algae that's growing. He is totally sort of in heaven in the sense of it's something completely different from his life on the lifeboat and he's finally able to eat and feel full and have his feet on land. I would conservatively estimate to be hundreds of thousands of meerkats. The landscape was covered in meerkats and then he notices that it's not just these trees and this algae that's growing with no soil that there's all of these meerkats around and then he notices something even stranger. The meerkats were bringing ashore dead fish they had not killed but what were seafaring fish doing in a freshwater pond? How had they got there? The algae naturally and continuously desalinated seawater. The effect of bathing in pure, clean, salt-free water was more than I could put into words. Once again, that idea of perspective, right? 
something maybe we take for granted in our everyday life of bathing not in seawater something that is really important and groundbreaking to Pi at this point in his journey he killed beyond his need he killed mere cats that he did not eat in animals the urge to kill is separate from the urge to eat to go for so long without prey and suddenly to have so many his pent-up hunting instinct was lashing out with a vengeance so this is a significant point because throughout this journey, Pai and Richard Parker, and we spoke about this in a previous video about how they sort of come together and um, they unite and they sort of become one aspect or aspects of each other in this shared journey and shared experience. But as soon as there's a change, as soon as now they're not stuck on this lifeboat together, they're exploring this island, immediately they both turn to their individual ways. So Pi goes towards the, the human side, right? He's going to eat, he's going to bathe, he's going to engage with that aspect of himself. And Richard Parker delves into sort of animalistic urges to kill for the sake of killing. So just notice how when they're in the, in the same boat, literally and figuratively, then they um, they sort of start becoming alike. But as soon as there's a you know there's some sort of normality in terms of land, then there's a shift, and we're going to see that in Mexico as well when Richard Parker leaves um, leaves Pi very unceremoniously. The next morning after he had gone, I cleared cleaned the lifeboat. So it's just like a new start, a new perspective, and this is sort of links to what I think this island venture is really about it's about sort of this new slate or this reset that pi has that allows him to keep going and allows him to persevere and survive until mexico put simply i return to life i lived through a major storm while on the island and after the experience i would have trusted staying on it during the worst hurricane it was an awe-inspiring spectacle to sit in a tree and see giant waves charging the island in this respect, the island was Gandhian. It resisted by not resisting. Every wave vanished into the island with a clash, with only a little frothing and foaming. So there's a little bit of like mystique here. It's very mysterious and almost magical. How can this island be like this? Harder to understand was the island's complete desolation. I never saw such a stripped down ecology. The air of the place carried no flies, no butterflies, no bees, no insects of any kind. The trees sheltered no birds. The plains hid no rodents, no grubs, no worms, no snakes, no scorpions. They gave rise to no other trees, no shrubs, no grasses, no flowers. The ponds harbored no freshwater fish. The seashore teemed with no weeds, no crabs, no crayfish, no coral, no pebbles, no rocks. With the single notable exception of the meerkats, there was not the least foreign matter on the island, organic or inorganic. It was nothing but shining green algae and shining green trees. So if you get a contextual question about what makes this island different or weird or strange, you have lots of answers from this quote. Which meant that the trees, these trees either lived in a symbiotic relationship with the algae in a giving and taking that was to their mutual advantage, or simpler still, were an integral part of the algae, was rather a free-flowing organism, a ball of algae of le leviathan proportions. It would all bear much further study, but unfortunately I lost the algae that I took away. Just as I returned to life, so did Richard Parker. So he even claims that he took some of the algae and kept it in the lifeboat to study when he arrived on land, but unfortunately it got lost. And he says that he and Richard Parker both had this reset. They both returned to life. His weight went up, his fur began to glisten again, and he returned to his healthy look of old. He kept up his habit of returning to the lifeboat at the end of every day. I always made sure I was there before him, copiously marking my territory with urine so that he didn't forget who I was and what was whose. So remember that this is not just a complete break. He still has the lifeboat and obviously the lifeboat, he's still going to get back on it. Obviously not in the way that he expects at this point, um, but he makes sure to keep up sort of Richard Parker's training to keep that distance between them. So he really has this rational, reasonable headspace. That night, as he was resting two feet beneath me, I came to the conclusion that I had to step into the circus ring again. The major difficulty in training animals is that they operate either by instinct or by root. But he remained tense. I knew him well enough to sense it. Eventually, I quit the boat. To survive for so long in a lifeboat with a 450-pound Bengal tiger only to die up in the tree in the hands of two-pound meerkats struck me as, tra as a tragedy too unfair and too ridiculous to bear. Not a square inch of space was left free. So... Um, he decides that he's going to now sleep on the island, sleep in the tree, why not? And um, he does this and leaves Richard Park to the lifeboat. Um, but he, when he's up there one night, all these meerkats come crowding around him. And he has this little like statement where he's like, this would be a, a real tragedy if I died from all these meerkats in a tree when I've been surviving for days and days on end 
with a 450 pound tiger on a tiny lifeboat. So, I began to sleep in the tree every night. I emptied the lifeboat of its useful items and made myself a nice treetop bedroom. The answer to the mystery came somewhere later, from deep within the forest. I noticed the tree because it seemed to have fruit. Each was at its centre, a number of twigs that were tightly curled around it to protect, I suppose. So now this is when he's going to find out the truth of the island. And he, he wishes that he hadn't figured out the truth of the island, but he does. Ah, how I wish that motive, moment had never been, but for it I might have lived for years. Why, the rest for the rest of my life on that island. Nothing, I thought, could ever push me to return to the lifeboat and to the suffering and deprivation I had endured on it. Nothing. What reason could I have to leave the island? Were my physical needs not met here? Were there not more fresh water than I could drink in all my lifetime? More algae than I could eat? And when I yearned for variety, more meerkats and fish than I could ever desire? If the island floated and moved, might it not move in the right direction? Might it not turn out to be a, a vegetable ship that brought me to land? In the meantime, did I not have these ve delightful meerkats to keep me company? And wasn't Richard Parker still in need of improving his fourth jump? The thought of leaving the island had not crossed my mind once since I had arrived. It had been weeks, many weeks now. I couldn't say exactly, couldn't say how many exactly, and they would stretch on. I was certain about that, how wrong I was. And then it came to light, an unspeakable pearl at the heart of the green oyster a human tooth. 32 teeth, a complete human set, not one tooth missing. Understanding dawned upon me. I did not scream. I think only in movies is horror vocal. I simply shuddered and left the tree. I think that's such, an, such a wonderful um, way that he's put that. And as once again, it makes it really realistic in his reaction that he doesn't scream. He's just completely, he, he has this understanding and he runs to lifeboat. He knows he has to get away from this island. And so he sees that this island is this carnivorous island that is sort of absorbing people or absorbing living things still my feet burned they burned all night i couldn't sleep for it and from the anxiety the island was carnivorous this was why richard parker returned to the boat every night this was why the meerkat slept in the trees this was why i'd never seen anything but algae on the island how long does it take for a broken spirit to kill a body that has food water and shelter I prefer to set off and perish in search of my own kind than to live a lonely half-life of physical comfort and spiritual death on this murderous island. I filled my stores with fresh water and drank like a camel. I ate algae throughout the day until my stomach could take no more. I killed and skinned as many meerkats as would fit in the locker and on the floor of the lifeboat. I reaped dead fish from the ponds. With the hatchet, I hacked off a large mass of algae and worked a rope through it, which I tied to the boat. I could not abandon Richard Parker. To leave him would mean to kill him. He would not survive the first night. Alone in my lifeboat at sunset, I would know that he was burning alive, or that he had thrown himself in the sea where he would drown. I waited for his return. I knew he would not be late. So he makes preparations to leave the island. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's almost like this literal, well, to him it's literal. To me, I would think it's more figurative. But either way, it's this reset that he has, and he will refuses to leave Richard Parker behind. Um, this, this really emphasizes their connection as well um but yeah so you can you definitely have to be writing in your contextual questions about the island being literal as pi sees it that this was something that actually happened um but yeah in my mind this is more of a reset or some sort of hallucination that gives them the energy and the power to continue to to go but that's my opinion okay then when he arrives in mexico um remember he is taken to the hospital and this um the quotes that I've brought here, this is when he is telling his story to the um, Japanese investigators who come to investigate the, shink the sinking of the ship. They're trying to find out answers about it and they're completely taken aback with Pi's story. They don't really believe him and then he changes the story and this is where it really, if you thought the novel was complicated up to this point, then now it gets even more complex and more detailed and more makes you think about different things and the more we're going to have all different interpretations. Anyone who reads this I think has a different interpretation. He and Mr. Tuba spoke with Mr. Paisley and Mulitta Patel, Patel in English for close to three hours, taping the conversation. February 19th, 1978. I'd like another cookie. Yes, of course, Mr. Chiba. He's already had plenty and most he hasn't even eaten. They're right there beneath his bedsheet. So Pai immediately asks for, um, for more food and he doesn't actually eat it. He just hides it. And this shows the impact of the pacific on him obviously he's still recovering it's just been a couple weeks since since he was um since he found land um and so he's like hoarding food at this point mr patel we don't believe your story these things don't exist 
to which Pi responds, only because you've never seen them. Not plants that contradict the laws of nature. What you don't realize is that we are all strange and forbidding species to wild animals. We fill them with fear. They avoid us as much as possible. It took centuries to still the fear in some pliable animals. Domestication, it's called. But most cannot get over their fear, and I doubt they ever will. When wild animals fight us, it is out of sheer desperation. They fight when they feel like they have no other way. It's a very last resort. In a life vote, come on, Mr. Patel, it's just too hard to believe. If you stumble at mere believity, what are you living for? Isn't love hard to believe, Mr. Patel? Don't you bully me with your politeness. Love is hard to believe, ask any lover. Life is hard to believe, ask any scientist. God is hard to believe, ask any believer. What is your problem with hard to believe? We're just being reasonable. So am I. I applied my reason at every moment. Reason is excellent for getting food, water, sorry, food, clothing, and shelter. Reason is the very best toolkit. Nothing beats reason for keeping tigers away, but being excessively reasonable and you risk throwing out the universe with the bath water. So they have a lot of back and forth, as you can see here, lots of inverted commas going everywhere um, between Pi and these investigators. And they're just coming to ask him a very simple questions. They want to know how the shim sank, how he survived. And he is telling his story. But because he's Pi and because we know all the history about him and his beliefs and how he survived and how he combined reason and faith and everything, um, he's providing them a story, but they don't believe the story, specifically the part about the island, because they don't think it's reasonable. And Pi is questioning that, and he's actually making a really good point here, if you read it carefully. And so he challenges them, and he challenges the reader to, to think about belief and reason in different ways. So this idea that um, we spoke about in the previous video about themes, reason is excellent for getting food, clothing, and shelter. Reason is the best toolkit. And this really shows us how he does employ reason, but... He also employs faith, as he says, and hope, because he says if you're just reasonable, excessively so, you risk throwing out the universe with the bathwater. We are not seeking to lay criminal charges. You are an innocent victim of a tragedy at sea. We are only trying to determine how the Sitzman sank. We thought you might help us, Mr. Patel. Tigers exist, lifeboats exist, oceans exist. Because the three have never come together in your narrow limited experience, you refuse to believe that they might. Yet the plain fact is that the Sisman brought them together and then sank. So he's saying the the investigators are like, This is crazy. How can you how can you have this scenario of you on a lifeboat with a tiger? And Pi just puts it to them in very plain terms and says, Well, you've seen all these separate things, you know that they exist. Now why is it so difficult to believe that they come together? They also find trouble with the blind um, Frenchman story. Two blind people in two separate lifeboats meeting up in the Pacific. The coincidence seems a little far-fetched. No, it certainly does. We find it very unlikely. So is winning the lottery, yet someone always wins. We find it extremely hard to believe. So did I. And then Pi says, okay, um... Oh, sorry, not there yet. The cook on this spin was a Frenchman. They could be bones from another small animal. They were meerkats. So they keep questioning every single aspect of Pi's story. And they say, oh, did the Frenchman, do you mean because, you know, the cook on the on the ship, he was a Frenchman? And he says, well, no. And they said, oh, the bones, that because um, Pi says he has bones from the meerkats on the, on the boat to prove the existence of this island. And they were like, well, it could be from another small animal. And Pi keeps saying, no, believe my version of the story. And then he brings up something I never forgot, not for a minute. I lost my whole family. And then when the investigators still don't believe him, he says, okay, so you want another story? And they say, uh, no, we would like to know what really happened. Doesn't the telling of something always become a story? Isn't it just looking upon this world already something of an, inv of, of an invention? I know what you want. You want a story that won't surprise you, that will confirm what you already know, that won't make you see higher or further or differently. You want a flat story, an immobile story. You want dry, useless factuality isn't that such a wonderful use of words in the way that he um in the way that this writer has written it's just such beautiful writing um and he basically says yeah he understands what they want they don't want any sort of what actually happened what they actually want is a sort of flat believable story that fits into what they've already decided happened with this story so it's a really interesting to think of to think about as the reader and this is a really philosophical book that really makes the reader think about all these all these big questions in life so I'm right. You want a story without animals. We want a story without animals that will explain the sinking. And then Pi says, 
here's another story. So now he's going to provide an alternative version of events. And for us as the readers, we need to analyze this and we need to see which version do we believe. And I'll leave that up to you to decide um, which version you would believe. But Pi presents this whole other story now without the animals. In order to make these investigators believe him, this flat story which would fit into their version of events that they've sort of made up in their head. Four of us survived. Mother held onto some bananas and made it to the lifeboat. The cook was already abroad, as was the sailor. So you can see how he's equated each of the animals to a human being. I couldn't believe a human being could survive so much pain, so much butchery. It was unbearable to have that beautiful face so noble and serene connected to such a sight below. I held my mother's head in my hands. And this part of the story goes really quickly. It goes through because we've obviously heard the whole story with the animals. And now it compares the mother to the orangutan. Um, the cook to the hyena and the sailor to the zebra and very quickly the sailor dies a terrible death and then the mother is brutally murdered by the cook. He knew it had gone too far even by his bestial standards. Solitude began, I turned to God and survived. And turned to God, I survived. So that's when he then gets revenge on the cook and he kills the cook. Something that I find really strange about this story and why I am personally inclined to believe the story with the animals is that the cook becomes extremely violent very quickly. Like just as they're on the boat, he immediately starts worrying about food and becoming sort of having these um, thoughts about cannibalism and things like that. It's just it's almost too quick in my opinion. Um, so to me, the animal story makes more sense, but obviously you are welcome to have your, to have your own opinion. Um, and then now he's by himself in the ocean, solitude began. Is that better? Are there any parts you find hard to believe? Anything you'd like me to change? So now he, he asks them, and it's quite humorous to think about um, how these sort of serious investigators are trying to get a story and Pi's telling them a story like, this doesn't make sense. It's hard to believe. And he's like, okay, let me change the story for you. And then at the end, he's like, anything else you'd like me to change? And if it had, in my experience, when a dingy third rate rust bucket sinks, unless it has the luck of carrying oil, lots of oil, enough to kill the entire ecosystem, no one cares and no one hears about it. You're on your own. You have doubts about the fitness of the crew. So the ship sank um, stern first. Did it appear to you that the ship was properly loaded? And this is Pi's response because the investigators want a reason for why the ship sank and he has no idea. He says, it was my first time on a ship. I don't know what a properly loaded ship should look like. Hi, 25, 30 feet. He's trying to describe the waves. And they say, that's quite modest actually. And he replies, not when you're in a lifeboat. And they say, yes, of course, but for a cargo ship. So he really like, it just shows us once again that Pi is a 16 year old boy or now he's probably like 17 when he arrives back um, he arrives in Mexico and he um, is you know he doesn't know the specifics and so the investigators are trying to get a story out of him that they're never going to get because he doesn't know all the specifics but it's also what he says here about the waves and they're like oh that's not too high and he's like well it depends what perspective you're coming from that tells you whether that's actually high and dangerous or not in both story the ship sinks my entire family dies and I suffer that's true, right? So um, this is Pi being very realistic and very sort of blatant and brazen. He says, well, in both of the stories, I'm struggling and I lose and I suffer. So tell me, since it makes no factual difference to you and you can't pr prove the question either way, which story do you prefer? Which is the better story? The story with animals or the story without animals? Um, I think that this is such, such an interesting question, like which story do you prefer? Because I'll say which one do you believe is true? He says, okay, either of them are asking, neither of them are answering your question. Which do you prefer? And I think it makes us think about novels in general. And it's one of those awesome moments I find when you read a novel and it makes you think about the writing itself. Very thin, very tough, very bright. Soul Survivor could shed no light on reasons for sinking of Sitzman. As an aside, Story of Soul Survivor, Mr. Paisi Molitor Patel, Indian citizen, is an astounding story of courage and endurance in the face of extraordinarily difficult and tragic circumstances. In the experience of this investigator, his story is unparalleled in the history of shipwrecks. Very few castaways can claim to have survived for so long as he, as Mr. Patel, and none in the company of an adult Bengal tiger. So the last few lines, these are from the report that was generated by the investigators and they comment that obviously the ship sinking could not be solved, but that's not the 
Um, and that's not what our focus has been on for this entire story, but he says something to note is the incredible nature of Pi and how, um, you know, whether it's true or not, what he claimed to survive so long at sea with a tiger is absolutely sort of exceptional and miraculous. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found that video helpful. Please remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next video.